You gave me the okay? Okay. Well, good. We can go. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> How is everybody? Everybody smiling? Doing well? It's a good day. It's a good day. You know, it's a little leaky outside, but it's a good day. All right. Are there any announcements we need to make this morning? I don't know of any. Good to see you. And uh, if you'd be turning your Bibles to Genesis chapter 3, we're going to try to look at the whole chapter so it means we won't get into a lot of details. We'll get into some. And then my hope is next week to do Genesis 4 and 5. I think we can do Genesis 4 and 5 together <laughs> without uh, too much problem because Genesis 5 is a little genealogy there. But anyway, I hope you had a great week. I hope you're doing well and been blessed this week. In Genesis chapter 3, we see the first temptation. You know, we say that the book of Genesis is a lot first. There's a lot of first. There's the you know first day, creation, thus the first of the beginning of the world. Uh, this is the first temptation. And this is the first sighting of Satan. And if you look in verse 1, it says, The serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. Now, I want you to think about what is said here with regards to Satan. I want you to think about what is not said. What is not said is who it is, right? It refers to it as a serpent. You don't see the word devil. You don't see the word satan. The word Hebrew word satan means adversary. You see the devil. But you see, or you see the serpent. But we understand it, of course, to be the devil, and if nothing else, because later on, especially when you get to the New Testament, you have a reference there. You have a couple of references that talk about the serpent and the Satan beguiling Eve. And so we understand that this serpent is, of course, Satan. But Satan comes and uses the serpent, is in the form of the serpent. And notice that it says that he was more cunning. The word cunning is the idea of he is slick. You know, he, he's slicker than a greased pig. He, he, he's got it. He knows, he knows how to, to manipulate. He knows how to do. He's subtle. But when you get to this, and you look at this, and you say, okay, this subtle serpent is Satan. And we have to ask, well, who is he? Where did he come from? Now, we remember, remember, we come at the Bible, all of us here this morning, we come at the Bible with the understanding of what we have through the past. Now, it could be that we, we were brought up going to church. You know, that's the old saying. I was carried to church, you know, brought up from the time I was Bo's age. Uh, I've been to church my whole life. And so when we go back and say, okay, well, we're going to study Genesis 3, we come at it from the perspective of what we've experienced in the past, what we've been taught. But sometimes, let me encourage you to go and read a book of the Bible, especially one that maybe is your favorite, but read it from a different perspective. Read it from the perspective of I don't know anything other than what I'm reading now. And I don't know any of the past. I don't know anything about it. Because here's the thing that, at least for me, it, first of all, it wakes you up to a whole new, different and new understanding of the text. But you know why? one of the reasons why we in the church today, we sit there and say we don't get why people don't understand what we're saying. If you are just a common average Joe with an, with an education. I don't mean just a just somebody that's uneducated, but with a with a good education. How often do you hear the words redemption, propitiation, reconciliation? Not much, right? Justification, sanctification, not much. We use terms, and I understand that we do, and I do too. Use them all the time, but we use terms that folks aren't familiar with and are not comfortable with. 
Well, when we get to the Bible, we, we do the same thing. But we need to sometimes look at it from the perspective of, I've never seen this before, and whoever I teach it to may have never seen this before. And so uh, look at it and study it from that perspective. Well, when you look at Genesis, if you started in the Bible and you didn't, you didn't have a, a knowledge of the rest of the Bible, the first thing you'd say is, well, who's this Satan? Where did he come from? Well, other texts tell us basically that... Uh, and we have to kind of infer some things. We believe that he was created being. Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 6, God made all things therein, heaven and earth and all things therein. We, we also believe that he was probably a, an angel, a fallen angel of God, and uh, that even there have been those that have said, uh, in if you go to 1 Timothy 3, where it's talking about the qualifications for an elder, and it talks about... Uh, Really, I guess the, the idea would be envy or jealousy, and they are different, but that um, that, th- that it came from Satan and that Satan had that and that was the original problem, that's a little far-fetched. But what we do have <clears throat> and what we do know when we look at the Bible and we study the book of Genesis is you're not going to find the word devil. Matter of fact, you're not going to find the word devil in the Old Testament. And you're only going to find the word Satan used 14 times. And so we don't have a lot about Satan, the devil, in the Old Testament. We do have more, if you will, in the New Testament. And that's where we come at our perspective and understanding of who Satan is. Well, let's get back to the story of Genesis. The serpent, he's more cunning than any of the beasts of the fields, which the Lord God has made. And he said to woman... He asked a question, has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Simple question. But what is Satan attacking? He's really not attacking Eve, is he? He's attacking what God has said. He's trying to put doubt in her mind of who God is and why should she listen to God. But here's the question. Did God say you shall not eat of every tree in the garden? And, of course, the woman says, well, we may eat of the trees of the, of the garden, but the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God said you shall not eat of it. Notice not eat of it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. I want you to look at those two verses just a tad bit differently. I want you to I want you to look at something. I want you to look in verse two at the word may. We may eat. And then in verse three, she says, God says, You shall not eat. I want you to come away with an appreciation, which I know you already do, but I want you to come away with appreciation of understand uh, of this. That this Bible that we read and this Bible that we believe to be God's Word and this Bible that we study has both positives and negatives. It tells you what you can't do, but it also tells you what you can do. We often hear folks say, and especially in my years, recent years, the millennials, the 20s and 30-year-olds, uh, they're saying, you know, well, the Bible is a bunch of thou shalt nots. Yeah, you look at the Ten Commandments, you got more nots than do's, right? But you still got do's. The Bible tell the Bible not only reproves, but it also convicts. You know, Paul says that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for reproof, for correction, but also for instruction. In righteousness. And so we can come at this Bible with a, a very negative approach. You know, it's nothing but negative and, and uh, we follow, you know, a negative God. And, and that's really not so. If anything, God's very balanced, right? Would Paul say in the book of Romans, behold the goodness and the what of God? Severity of God. Balanced. The Bible's balanced. We just quoted uh, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. It, it has both you know, pluses and minuses. 
God's balanced. Bible's balanced. We're to live a balanced life. <laughs> and we're not to turn from it. Joshua chapter 1, Joshua was reminded, don't turn from it to the right or the left. Remain balanced. But that's important. Balance is, is the key. Well, I say that just to kind of get you a, a different or fresh look. The woman answers the serpent. We've got that which we can eat of, but we've got that which we cannot. And knowing this, knowing that if they eat of it, there would be consequences, right? You'll die. Well, look in verse 4. The serpent said to the woman, you'll not die. So the serpent, as we know it in English, changes one word. She goes, he goes from you shall die, as God says, you shall not die. One word is added. Satan denies the word of God. Does that sound familiar? Satan denies what God has said. It's just that simple. So Satan says, oh, you're, you're not going to die. And then verse 5, he says the exact opposite. He says, God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. What does Satan imply here? And there, I don't know if there's a wrong or bad answer, but what does Satan imply? There's a touch of jealousy here in this, right? <laughs> Oh, you're going to be like God. You, and you, don't you want to be like God? Don't you want to be like God? You, you're going to be like God. So he's trying to, to touch her jealous side. He sows the seeds of doubt and distrust. But notice verse 6. The woman saw the tree. I want you to think about she looked upon the tree. That it was good for food, so she longed for it or lusted after it. That it was pleasant, desirable to the eyes, and so she liked what she saw. The tree was desirable to make one wise. Well, you know that that's boy, that's enticing, isn't it? It's going to open your eyes. It's going to make you see, and so. She begins then to linger and to think. And then she partook. She took of the fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband, and he ate. But the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. So you have first clothes. Think about it. How long were Adam and Eve in the garden before Satan came? Don't know. How long was it before their eyes were open and they realized that they were naked? Don't know. Seems to be almost immediately. When did they make their clothes? Don't know. How long did it take them to make their clothes? Don't know. You might say, well, preacher, why would you bring all those things up that you don't know? There's a lot of things in the Bible we don't know. Don't get upset about it. It's not important, to be honest, is it? When you get down to it, it's really not that important. And so they they made... Fig leaves, some sort of aprons. The idea there, the of the word coverings, has the idea of an apron. Now you might say, well, what kind of an apron? I don't know, and I don't know that there's any way really of knowing. You know, there are more than one kinds of aprons, right? You ever seen a lady in an apron? You don't see it much anymore. Some aprons go from head to toe. Some aprons go from waist down, right? How much were they covered? I don't know. Bible doesn't say. The Bible says, and what I think we should keep on is the idea that they are awake now to a condition that they were not awake to. So, uh, you know, the, the nudist would say, well, this is the natural way of going about things. Well, yeah, but then they woke up and saw that everyone wasn't pretty, so they put on clothes. No, I, no, no, no. <laughs> but Adam and Eve, they woke up if you will, 
after they had eaten the fruit. Now, think, something I want you to think about. I want you to think about, and I'm trying to hit little different highlights, not just the same things you've heard in Genesis. But I want you to, to think about who Satan talked to. He talked to Eve. Well, why didn't he talk to Adam? I don't know. What was Satan's Satan really trying to attack? You, you know, we said jealousy, and that would be true. Paul talked about, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, he talked to the church at Corinth, and he said, lest your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Jesus Christ. And then he talks about the temptation of Eve. For whatever reason, Satan tempted the mind, according to Paul, of Eve. Now, I'm not saying, I'm not imp- trying to say, well, that because she was less or because uh, she was not a thinker or she was not important or she was not bad. No, I think you, you really have to say Satan had to attack somebody. Now, could we say, well, were there times in which Adam were, was, uh, was tempted? If we say that, and I, and, and I don't think we can say that because Scripture's going to say. But if we say that, we have to be careful. And the, the care comes in the, the aspect and the thought that then Adam didn't give in. And why didn't he give in? But I don't think you can honestly say that, ask that question, or you can ask the question. I don't think you can find an answer because I don't think the Scriptures tell us. And so we're left with just the story, and that's what we need to stick with, just the facts. You remember the old Dragnet show? You know, and you remember you had one of those guys, just the facts, just the facts. Well, we just need to stick with just the facts. Just the facts. And so Eve partook. She gave to Adam. He partook. Then they heard, verse 8, they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden. Does somebody want to really explain that to me? And I'm serious. Does somebody really want to explain that to me? I know the word sound means voice. They heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden, in the cool or the wind or the breeze of the day. Now, there may be the answer. But I've never seen and I've never heard, if you will, from the standpoint of a voice walking. So, <clears throat> we use those terms, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> and that, that may be exactly, <clears throat> excuse me, that may be exactly the, uh, the reference or the idea of the thought. And so, I, I can't definitively say, but that, that could be a good way of looking at it. No, Yeah. You know, he's coming. It's time to straighten up and fly right, right? <laughs> so that's the point. It's a good point. So we we talk about. You know, I, I was had looked at that a couple of times this week, and and uh, I was looking at it again last night, and I thought, okay, I I think I have a handle on it, but and I think you you all have given me some good help, good insights uh, further into what I was thinking. But notice that when they heard the voice, Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. So they hid. They hid themselves in the garden. How big was the Garden of Eden? I don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us. It had to be fairly good size. We also need to understand that garden is a little different than what we think of a garden, right? We think of a garden, we think of tomatoes, beans, corn, okra, stuff like that, right? You know, and nothing grows over, say, this tall, except for tomatoes. And, and you know, and if you keep cutting your okra, now your okra will grow to the sky if you keep cutting it. But, but uh, in the season's long enough. But the garden, or in 
biblical times, you know, it's like uh, the Garden of Eden and the Garden of Gethsemane. We wouldn't really think of them as as woods, forests, trees, gardens from that standpoint. Not gardens from the standpoint of rows and you know vegetables and but uh, trees and plants and and uh, just a beautiful landscape, if you will. So it's it's large enough that they go in, they try to hide themselves. In verse nine, Lord God called Adam and says, "Where are you?" So he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid. Adam's motivation for hiding was what? Fear. Fear of God. Fear of what's going to happen. Fear of the unknown. Can you think of another Bible example of somebody that either did or did not do something because of fear? Job? Who else or what else? How about the parable of the talents? One talent man said what? I was afraid. I scared. I hid my talent. There are others. Those are good ones. Fear, though, becomes a great motivating factor. I did not fear my father. I did not fear my mother. I feared what they could do to me and what they would do to me. Uh, my, my parents, you know, you walk straight line. And uh, we, my sister and I get together quite often and, and every once in a while we'll we'll talk about our growing up days and uh, i usually say yeah i got more whippings than you got and she just says well consider the source move on and uh, uh i did i mean we got we got carol and i got everything equal really when you except i did get more spankings than she got and yeah there probably was a reason for that but while I never did fear my mother, I never did fear my father, I didn't appreciate, and I guess was somewhat fearful of what they would do. You know, used to, in my day of growing up, it was nothing to hear, and I understand the terminology, you can't use the terminology much anymore, but uh, when I was growing up in school, you know, somebody would say, well, I can't do that, my mother will kill me. You know, my daddy will kill me. We used to, and we knew they wouldn't kill us, but we might wish we did <laughs> in the middle of all that. They weren't going to kill us. You don't hear that much anymore. Now, admittedly, you, you know, you use those terms in, like, say, school system, teachers got a report uh, for several reasons, law reasons, insurance reasons, uh, protection reasons. But at the same time, too, maybe that's part of the problem. Our kids aren't afraid of us. And uh, but Adam and Eve, Adam says, I, I was I was fearful. I was afraid. He said, I knew I was naked. Well, notice sort of verse 11. And he said, who told you that you were naked? God, God's question is a matter of deduction. In other words, Adam, who told you this? And Adam was probably stumped because he the only person he could really say well, Eve, because at that point, we don't uh, think that Adam and Eve had children. And so, you know, God's getting folks to think. If I ever ask you a question, sometimes it's simply to get you to think. Now, you may still come up with an answer that I don't agree with, and that's fine. But if we're in private conversation and maybe in counseling sometimes, uh, I'll ask a question. And that question is to get you to think because I can't, in, say, counseling, I can't, I can't tell you what to do. That's not fair to you, to be honest. If you came to, to me for counseling and you said, you know, uh, I've got this problem and what should I do? I can't give you an answer. I can take you through a series of questions to get you to think and to reason through your situation 
to the point that you come to an answer that you're comfortable with. Now, if I'm not comfortable with it, in other words, you come to the conclusion, well, all I, all I need to do is go out and die, I'm going to take you a different direction. If your conclusion is to the point that it is unscriptural, I'm going to take you to a different, I'm going to, I'm going to try to take you to a different conclusion. But the questions are there to get you to think, to get you to come to your conclusion. The questions are here to get Adam to think. And so God says, well, who told you? Well, notice verse 12. What does man begin to do? Blame somebody else. Point a finger at somebody else. Never my fault. I didn't do that. Remember on Friday nights, ABC, Steve Urkel? Did I do that? You remember that show? We often want to say, I, I didn't do it. It's not my fault. And so he says, well, the woman, now, now think, about, think about the lack of thinking on Adam's part. The woman, okay, that you gave me, he not only blamed Eve, he not only threw her under the bus, he threw God under the bus. That's, that's Adam not too bright. That's not the smartest thing in the world. Somebody kidded the other day about throwing me under the bus. I said, I've been thrown under the bus so many times. I'm so flat, it doesn't matter. You can throw me under the bus. It'll be all right. But notice in verse 13, the Lord said to the woman, what is this that you've done? God's question again, meant for a little bit of self-inspection, self-examination. What have you done? Well, she's having to think, and notice what she says. The serpent deceived me, and I ate. Here's the question. What was the serpent's deception? Serpent's deception really was God does not know what he is talking about. That was the deception. God has no clue. I am smarter than God. That's Satan's deception. And so, the Lord then cursed, if you will, placed a curse, I think would probably be a better way of saying, the serpent. He says, because you've done this, you're cursed. The word cursed there, the, the Hebrew word literally means banned. You're banned. You're cursed more than all cattle. And more than every beast of the field, on your belly you shall go and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And I'll put enmity. Uh, I don't know if you're like me, but I always like to look words up. The word enmity actually means actively opposed to something or hostile. I'll put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed, and he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. This is, if you think about it, this is the first mention of the gospel. This is the first mention of the good news. Satan, I'm going to come and I'm going to put between you and between the woman, and I'm going to put problems between you and mankind, between your seed and her seed. You'll bruise your head, or he shall bruise your head. Mankind will bruise the head of Satan. And notice that he says, you shall bruise his heel. Now think about the difference in being bruised. Bruised by in your head or in your heel. Which would you rather have? Would you rather have the bruise of the heel or the bruise of the head? If you bruise something's head, usually they're doing what? Killing it, right? But if you bruise somebody's heel, you've just inflicted pain. Unless you're a poisonous snake. That's right. And I know they're not, but in my eyes, all snakes are poisonous. <laughs> I will tell you a story, and then you can figure out if it's true or not, because I think technically it's against the law. But there may have been a day this summer in which I had mowed the yard and weed eat it and I was blowing off and, and I blew, blew off the little steps up to the front porch and I went to blow off the front porch. And when I did, there may have been a four foot long chicken snake that 
fell from my porch to the ground. There also may have been a shovel in my hand just a few minutes later that hit upon the snake's head. Accidentally, Accidentally yes. <laughs> and there may not be, uh, there may be one less chicken snake in this area than there was at that point in time. Before that, now I can't, I can't affirm all that because I've just basically told you, according to what I understand the law to be, I've broken the law. And to be honest, didn't think about that till. Possibly after the 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 the, uh, the defendant <laughs> was no more. <laughs> but uh, I don't like snakes. Now I will tell you, I let two go back in the spring that were up by the fence as I was weed eating. They were there. Uh, it seemed to be as if they were mating, and I let them go, and they went on into at that time it was the Perry's property. I don't know who owns it now, and headed towards the the creek this way. But um, God says, Satan, I'm going to, man is going to bruise your head. In other words, you're going to be overcome. But I, you, you'll bruise his heel. You'll create problems for man. This is, as we said, this is really in many ways the first mention of the gospel. Where, where is Satan defeated? At the cross, right? Satan's defeated at the cross. And so that's the curse that he places upon the serpent. By the way, we haven't stopped. Anybody got anything else they want to say or add? Huh? Does that mean the You know, that's a great question, which I don't know the answer, but it seems it might have. Seems as it might because what does he say? Own your belly, you shall go. Well, from this point on, we're known. <laughs> Alligator? No, wouldn't think so. He's he's in the reptile family, I would think. Anything else? To the woman, there is punishment as well. So the serpent has punishment. The woman has punishment. I'll greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. No. That we know of. We do know later, you know, we'll see Genesis 5. Yes, they had children. But at that point, yeah, there hadn't been. And so... Uh, when he, the the two the two punishments, the first one is pain in childbirth, as Jay said, uh, for those that are on the telephone. As far as we know, there hadn't been childbirth at that point in time. But nevertheless, there is a pain, this is part of the punishment, a pain in childbirth. And there is. I saw Suzanne deliver Ethan. And uh, Lord love you women. Bless you. We are thankful for you. And uh, those of you that will go through it more than once, bless your hearts. Um, we wanted to. We didn't get to. Uh, we weren't that blessed. But uh, to go through the pains of childbirth. And then notice the second one. The second is that she shall be uh, in subjection to her husband. That's a problem in this day and age. That thought and no, you know, when we read it, there's that word right at the end of verse 16, rule. We don't like that word in this day and age. And I agree that in, in our setting of today, it sure does sound maybe more powerful than we want to think of it. We have to remember there has to be order. Somehow there has to be order. In the church. We know Christ is the head of the church, so he is the definitive answer for everything in the church. But then we break it down. The Lord says, you know, well, each congregation is autonomous, and each congregation should have, if there are those that are qualified, elders. Elders are the leaders of the congregation. Uh, okay, so there has to be order within our political system. Well, we have president, we have House of Representatives, we have Senate. Okay, so we have at least some sort of order as it comes down through the line, supposedly. And then you say, well, okay, in the family there has to be an order. 
I like the old adage, and I can't remember who said it uh, many years ago, but he said, so, if the two people ride a horse, somebody has to ride in front. Now, that's a, that's a pretty good saying. Some, there has to be an order of some kind. And so there is an order. And the order is, is that the husband is the head of the family. Now, leadership styles have to be good. Leadership styles have to be such that, you know, your folks want to follow you. They have to be, you have to communicate. You have to talk. You have to, to be a, the kind of person that uh, folks want to follow you by virtue of what you say and what you do. And we can get into a lot of other things with regards to leadership styles. But here is the order that God put in family. Somebody's got to be the head, so he, he made uh, the husband the head of the family. That does not mean, nor should we ever conclude, that that means that the husband is more valuable, more important than the wife. No. You know, if you go back to the book of Galatians, Paul will tell us that we're all one in Christ. That no one is more valuable than the other. You know, no one is more important than the other. I was raised in a family. My mother had five siblings. And at Christmas and at Thanksgiving especially, we got together. When my my mama and my papa were still alive. We all got together at their house. And my mama and papa had a table that would seat three, six, eight people at the table. And that would get all the men. They went first and ate. Now, I've heard, you know, some folks say, well, my family, the children ate last. We, kids, got to eat at the same time the men did. My my grandparents had a drop leaf table on, off to the side that sat off to the side in the corner uh, all year long, except for Thanksgiving and Christmas. Thanksgiving and Christmas was set up, and we kids ate at the same time that our, our daddies ate. And then the women ate later after we all got up. They cleaned off the table, fixed their pl- or sat down, fixed their plates, and ate. Now, the reason they did that is because they talked in the kitchen while we were eating, and then when... They sat. They could sit there as long as they wanted to and eat. They didn't have to get up, go somewhere else. They'd sit there at the table for an hour or two before they get up and clean dishes up. That was the order of that family, of our family. And then when it kind of broke up and more of them started coming to my mom and daddy's house, uh, we all ate at the same time. That's not to say, though, my family, my with all my uncles and aunts and cousins, and we all got together, that some were more important than others. You know why we ate that way? That's as big as the dining room would hold. That's why we ate that way. Why did we not all sit together? Because the dining room wasn't big enough. Food was big. It didn't mean that the, the men were more valuable. It didn't mean that the children were more valuable. It just meant that this is what we had to do. So that's that's the idea, and that's the idea we ought to come away with. All are important to God. All are valuable. But then notice uh, the man's punished. A- Adam, to Adam he said, because you've heeded the voice of your wife. So Eve, I want you to catch something in this. Eve was beguiled. Eve was deceived. Adam Deceived, yes, but there seems to be a difference. Eve was deceived. Adam was led away. He heeded the voice of the wife. And because you've eaten of the tree, notice what he says. Curses the ground for your sake, and toil you'll eat of it in the days of your life, both thorns and thistles. It shall bring forth to you, and you shall eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. You're going to work. There's your curse. You're going to work. You're going to eat at the ground, but it's not going to be easy. You're going to you're going to eat of a ground in which you have taken care of, a ground which you've worked. 
And so really the idea of employment is, is mentioned here. But you're going to eat and it's not going to be easy. Adam called his wife's name Eve. Basically, up to this point, she was just woman. Now she's called Eve. Eve just simply means life or living. Because she's mother of all living. Also, Adam and his wife, God made tunics of skin and clothed them. I was reading somebody this week, and I never, I, I never thought about it in this light. But here's what they said. This means that man has the right to kill animals, slay animals. Well, you know, we have to ask ourselves, why did God put them here? And so uh, they made tunics of skin. They clothed themselves. And then, beginning in verse 22, I want to look at that. Anything anybody want to say? Yeah, I don't know. That's a great question. I wonder. Yeah, yeah. That that's. No, he never did. That's right. That's exactly right. And so I don't know. You wonder. Speculation, supposition, and assumption, and all that can be. Of how much did God create the animals, and then of how much would there have been in order to keep going? And I don't know the answer to that. Yeah, yeah, I, they were healthy, you know, uh, that's right. The Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us to know good and evil. Now, I look at that, and, and you know the thing that catches me about that? He's become like one of us. That's what intrigues me in that statement. The statement basically is man's now open to see that there is there's a difference between good and evil. But the us there, I, I kind of think it goes back to what we talked about in Genesis 1, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We're all connected in the what's called the royal plural the us there, and so the Father here is talking as well to the Son and the Holy Spirit. And so he says, man, man's become like us. He knows the difference between good and evil. Now, lest he put out his hand and take also the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out of the Garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. So he drove out the man, and he placed cherubim at the east of the Garden of Eden, a flaming sword, which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. So man was cast out of the Garden of Eden. Man had a right to the tree of life. Here's the question I, I told you to give thought of this week, and you may have, and you may not have, and that's fine. And the answer I, I'm going to give you, you may not like, and that's fine too, because this is not something you know we're going to establish our salvation on. But I asked you to think about, was man made mortal or was man made immortal? I believe that man was made mortal, but had the right to the tree of life. Why do I think he was mortal? Well, first of all, he did eat. Eating does what for you? It keeps you going, right? Second of all, we talked about, in Genesis chapter 1, we talked about uh, the law of thermodynamics where energy is created and then it breaks down. That's man. It makes sense. Because then when he's cast out of the Garden of Eden, what does he not have the right to? Tree of life, right? Tree of life, he could live eternally. As long as he partook of it. When he no longer had that right, when the garden, if you will, was closed, when the, he no longer had the, the ability to take the tree of life, Death came upon him. Now, in Romans chapter 5, it says, Wherefore is by one man sin entered the world, and death by sin. So death is passed upon all men, for all have sinned. Romans chapter 5, verse 12. We use that verse many times in talking in funerals. We use that verse many times in talking about why we die physically. 
And I do think that there's a truth to that. I think you can use that verse that way. But if you look at the context of Romans 5, he's talking about spiritual death, not physical death. Is it true that when man was cast out of the garden, thus he died? Yes. Next week when we look in Genesis chapter 5, we're going to see several things. We're going to see folks that lived hundreds of years. But go back and look at it this week, and you're going to find one verse that, or one word that's common in all of them. Well, actually, three. Three words that are common in all of them. See what it is. I want you to think about something, though. This is the book of beginnings, and we have the first temptation, the first sin, first changing of a name, several other firsts. But I want you to think about from the standpoint of right here at the beginning, man lost his opportunity to have and to be a part of and partake of the tree of life. And the rest of the Bible is a book trying to inform us of how we can get back to having the tree of life. Mentioned, if you will, mentioned in Revelation chapter 22, verse 14, at the very end. Yeah, Ken. Could have, yeah. 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 Yeah, could be. Could be. Could be. Anything else? Anything we missed or all right, well let's bow for a word of prayer right quick. Our Father in heaven, we're thankful for this day, for the blessing of it. We're thankful for your word, for what it means to us and how it touches our lives and informs us and lets us know exactly what you want to know for us and how we came to be. We're thankful for Genesis 3, for the history that it gives us, for the insights that it gives us with regards to sin and and Satan and temptation. We ask that you'll give us the strength that we need day by day to live with you and for you, that we can withstand the temptation of, of Satan, that we can stand strong, and that we can ever live with you and for you. We ask that you watch over us, that you bless us and keep us, that you hold us within the hall of your hand as we hold to you. For this is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Have a great week. Thank you.